And then in the afternoons, there are these other short talks, I mean, uh, regular talks. And the courses are, so the first one is uh, Laurent Desvillers uh, from uh, the Université Paris Diderot on the collisions in plasma, the Landau equation. And uh, so let me just find these slides. And then I will handle you the microphone. Okay. So. Okay. So. Uh, I'm very glad to be here today. Actually, it's my second time here in the ICTP, but the first time was in the late 80s. So <laughs> as you can see, uh, I don't remember a lot of my first <laughs> time here. But what I remember is that it was really pleasant. <laughs> so I'm uh, really uh, uh, very thankful to the organizers for giving me this uh, opportunity today. I will uh, actually present uh, these five talks on the topic of the Landau equation. And um, the Landau equation is the uh, main equation that you use when you want to study collisions in a plasma. It was uh, written down first by uh, Lef Landau in the 30s. And uh, let's say the mathematical study of the equation started uh, I would say in the 70s, in the late 60s, and in the, in the 70s. And it's been since uh, a very active uh, topic in, in mathematics. And actually, there are really uh, two main directions. The first one being the study of the smoothness of the solution of the equation, and it's a very interesting topic. And the second one is the problem of the large time behavior of the equation, which is so somehow a different topic, and there is some interplay between the two. And so my uh, series of talks will be rather devoted to the question of the large time behavior. And so because of that, the, the first talk, what I will present today, is really uh, more related on the sort of general structure of um, the equations in which there is uh, uh, an entropy, as it is the case for the Landau equation. So for this first talk, we will not hear at all about the Landau equation, and it will be introduced actually uh, probably in the second talk, at the end of the second talk. So this first talk is really devoted to the general structure of equation having an entropy. So let me... Uh, give a few uh, standard definitions. So we will consider a Cauchy problem. By which uh, I mean that we have an equation which writes like this. So you have, let's say, at the abstract level, an equation in which you have an unknown, which I call u, which depends on time. And the uh, Cauchy problems is given by the derivative in time of u is equal to some operator acting on u. This operator needs not be um, linear or uh, differential or whatever. At this very abstract level, it can be absolutely uh, everything. And we add an initial datum, which I will denote like this. And let's say the, the solution lives in a certain uh, functional space, which I will call E, capital E. Uh, the first definition is the definition relative to Lyapunov functionals. which in the SQL I will rather call 
and entropy. But since the word uh, entropy has many meanings, uh, let's say that here we will use it only in this specific meaning of Lyapunov functional. Uh, and we will say that it is associated to the, to the equation above, which I will call, uh, let's say, uh, sorry, like this. Like. Uh, so, uh, a Lyapunov functional associated to this equation is a function which I will in general call H for uh, this is related I think to the notation H in the H theorem of Boltzmann that we will see in the sequel. Uh, and uh, this is a function which goes from the functional space E to R and um, we say that it is a Lyapunov functional when, when we take the derivative respect to time of h of u of t, then we get something uh, which has a sign. So in that case, uh, which is done positive. So this is a function such that for any solution u of the equation x, the quantity d over dt of h of u of t is non-positive. And when it is so, we will use the notation minus d of u of t for this quantity here. And the d here is for dissipation. This is the so-called dissipation of the entropy H. So D is called dissipation of entropy. So this is a situation which is quite common in physics and in many other fields. And uh, let me give a very simple example uh, consisting of a system of two differential equations. So suppose that you have uh, the system x prime is equal to minus y and y prime is equal to minus y and you take initial data which are respectively in R and in R plus, like this. Then you will call the functional space will just be uh, R times R plus. And one can easily check that starting with an initial datum which is not negative here, you always remain because of the differential equation uh, in the space of uh, non-negative uh, real numbers. So you can really select E like that. And for example, for H, you just take H of X and Y is equal to X. And it's immediate to see that if you select solutions of the uh, differential system, you get here minus Y of T. And since uh, y is uh, uh, non-negative, minus y is non-positive, and you get this. And so here d of x and y is defined just as y. However, um, this is a typical example in which it's not really useful to um, write down this Lyapunov functional. And the reason for that is that typically here uh, you get uh, 
an entropy or a Lyapunov functional which is not bounded below. And when it's like that, then usually it is not very helpful to uh, consider this entropy. And uh, because of this, one introduces a new notation for the Apunov functionals, uh, which are, uh, that we will call strict, uh, in the sense that they are bounded below, and uh, at the point where the entropy reaches its minimum, uh, we will suppose that we have uh, an entropy dissipation which is equal to zero and which also corresponds to equilibria of the equation. So when we are in such a situation, we will call the, the entropy strict. So let me write this. So this is, let's say, definition two, this one being uh, definition one. So, so we still consider uh, the equation uh, which is written here. And uh, when H is an entropy for uh, equation X, it is uh, said to be strict when the following uh, uh, properties uh, are satisfied. First, there exists a unique uh, equilibrium, which I will call U infinity, for equation X. So this means exactly that a u infinity is equal to zero. Uh, and uh, so I will systematically call it equilibrium. And we will suppose moreover the following. So uh, d of u is equal to zero if and only if u is the equilibrium. And also h of u infinity is strictly less than h of u for all u different from u infinity. So u infinity realizes the minimum of H. Another way of saying this, if you prefer, is to say that AU is equal to zero if and only if U is U infinity. Okay, this is the same as saying that there is a unique uh, equilibrium. So this is a situation that we will systematically consider in the, in the rest uh, of the lectures. So we have, uh, we will systematically consider equations in which there is uh, a strict entropy structure like this. So uh, let me give, yeah. Yes. Yes. Of course, it's possible also to, to have A which depend on T in some situations, but in what I will present, it will be, yes, systematically like that. Sorry. Um, yeah, so let me give one example uh, which is more interesting than this one. So this one, as you can see, cannot be strict because basically H is not bounded below, okay? So let me give this second example, and it will still be a system of two ordinary differential equations, but a system which is a little more complicated than the, than the previous one. So let's call it C2. 
and it's given by the following equations. Uh, and we will suppose that we have initial data which are both uh, just real numbers. So here the, the set E, the functional space that we consider is just R square. And uh, the natural uh, Lyapunov functional is just X square plus Y square. So we take X squared plus Y squared. So let's do the computation of this quantity. So let's suppose that X and Y are solutions to uh, the system C2. As you can see, you get uh, X prime of T. I will use this notation. This is the derivative with respect to the first variable of H. So I just use the chain rule at this level. And here, I observe that dh over d1 is just 2x, and dh over d2 is just 2y. Okay. So I just get 2x x prime plus 2y y prime. As you can see, the structure of the system is such that uh, when you multiply by uh, x, you get x squared, you multiply by y, you get y squared, then you add up, and you, sorry, so you end up with 1 plus x squared plus y squared, like this, times x squared plus y squared, and there is a factor 2 in front, if I'm not mistaken. And um, of course, this quantity is non-positive. And you can define the uh, associated uh, entropy dissipation using this formula here. And what you get is that d of x and y, the dissipation, D of X and Y is just uh, 2 times 1 plus X squared plus Y squared times X squared plus Y squared, like this. Okay? And now we can check uh, that this is a strict uh, entropy structure. So we have to verify those uh, assumptions here. So here, Let's first look at the equilibria of the uh, differential system. As you can see, this will be equal to zero plus this will be equal to zero only if both x and y are equal to zero, okay? So in, for, in this situation, uh, u infinity, which I will write x infinity, y infinity, like this, is just zero, zero. And this is the unique equilibrium. OK. Uh, moreover, um, it's clear that d of x and y is equal to 0 if and only if x equal y equal 0. Okay. So this is true. And finally, let's look at h of x and y. As you can see, h of x and y is strictly bigger than h of 0, 0, which is equal to 0, if and only if x, y is different from 0, 0. So here, it's extremely easy to check that you have a strict 
entropy structure for this set of two uh, differential equations, okay? Uh, once again, looking at this example here, it's very easy to see that here you don't have a strict entropy structure, okay? Now, the, there is uh, a general principle, which is sometimes called LaSalle principle, which tells that provided that you have uh, a certain number of conditions which are required, uh, when you have a strict entropy structure, you expect that if you look at the equation and you let t go to infinity, then you will converge towards the unique equilibrium. And this can be made as a theorem, provided that you put the right uh, assumptions, uh, especially assumptions related to compactness. But I will not go in this direction uh, today because uh, what I'm really interested in is effective, uh, explicit uh, estimates for the speed of convergence in such situations. So I will now, uh, because of this, uh, give a third definition, which is in some sense even more stringent than the definition for the strict entropy structure. And, uh, what I read right now is sometimes called uh, an entropy entropy dissipation structure. So let me write it here. So this is the third definition, the one which actually will systematically be satisfied in the equations that we will present in the in the rest of the talks. Um, so we still consider uh, an equation of the general form uh, which was written at the beginning. And we suppose that it is associated to a strict entropy structure. according to the second definition. So this means that we have a unique equilibrium, an entropy, and an entropy dissipation satisfying the constraints which are here. So we have at our disposal U infinity, H, and D. Okay. We say that an entropy, entropy dissipation and for the rest of the talks I will call this EED. I will not write again entropy, entropy dissipation. So we say that an entropy, entropy dissipation estimate holds Uh, and sometimes it's called a quantitative entropy estimate. Which is actually a vocabulary that I prefer, but it's less common than the vocabulary which is used here. So when one can find a strictly positive number, which I will call the C0, such that for all u in the functional space E, the entropy dissipation is bigger than the constant C0 times the entropy minus the entropy of the equilibrium. So when this holds, we call it usually so EED, like I said uh, previously. So it's uh, before commenting on, on this, or actually commenting on this, 
Uh, I, I would like to, to say that uh, this is not a priori crazy in the sense that we, because of the strict entropy structure, we know that h of u is bigger than h of u infinity. So this quantity anyway is non-negative and actually strictly positive except when u is equal to u infinity. And d of u basically satisfies the same constraint because of the definition. That is, d of u is equal to zero only when u is equal to u infinity. So there is some hope that such, by the way, does everybody see here? Yeah, it's okay. Well, <laughs> sorry because this is the most important <laughs> sentence here. So, uh, so such, uh, such an inequality is not completely absurd a priori. Uh, and the second comment is that, uh, as you can see here, in some sense, we have completely forgotten about the initial equation. That is, from the initial equation, what we retain is only those parameters here, which are related to the equation, the u infinity, the entropy, and the entropy dissipation. But the solution of the equation does not appear anymore here. So to check something like this has to do in general, let's say, with functional analysis, it's, it's trying to prove an inequality between uh, functions which are not directly related to the original uh, equation. Okay, there is some link, but it's not completely direct. So, why do we introduce this uh, definition here? It is because there is uh, an almost uh, immediate proposition that we can write down when we have such a situation and that I will prove immediately. So the proposition tells us that uh, let's see when uh, an equation x gives rise to an entropy entropy dissipation estimate. So it's exactly what we define here. Then the following uh, large time behavior estimate on the solutions of the equation holds. So the following estimate on the large time behavior of the solutions hold. So this estimate is the following. For all time non-negative, it's possible to bound the entropy at time t minus the entropy of the equilibrium. Remember that this is a non-negative quantity because we are looking to an equation with a strict entropy structure. And here I will have the difference of the entropy at time zero and the entropy of equilibrium times exponential minus C zero T C0 being the constant which appears in the inequality EED. Okay, so as you can see, this is something which tells you that the solutions of the original problem are converging towards the equilibrium in a very specific way. That is, it is the entropy of the solution at time t which converges exponentially fast 
towards the entropy of the equilibrium. And we will see later that in many situations, this is enough, in fact, to get an explicit estimate for the solution itself. But let's first concentrate on this. So the proof is very easy. It is just a direct application of uh, Grandwald's lemma. Indeed, uh, thanks to the entropy structure, we already know that if I, can, if I compute minus the derivative of this quantity here, This is, of course, the same as computing minus d over dt of h of u of t, because this one does not depend on t. And so this gives me exactly what I called d of u of t. So this is the entropy structure. And then I use at point u of t the general inequality that I know for any u in E. And this tells me that this is bigger than C0 times H of U of T minus H of U infinity, like this. Okay? So as you can see, I'm exactly in the situation in which Cronwell's lemma holds. That is, I have minus D over DT of something is bigger than C0 times something. And I deduce from this the inequality above. So we conclude thanks to Grenoil's lemma. Okay? So, um, this is kind of a general tool um, for uh, getting explicit estimates for the large time behavior of any kind of equations, provided that there is a dissipative structure represented by an entropy, uh, which is strict, and which can be sort of quantitatively estimated with respect to its dissipation. Let me uh, first come back to example two to show how it works. So for example one, there is of course no hope because the entropy structure is not uh, is not strict. But for example two, which is still written here, let's try to see what happens. Now my dissipation of entropy is two times one plus x plus y square times x square plus y square, and I have to compare it with h of u minus h of u infinity, which here is just x square plus y square minus the same quantity taken at point x equals zero and y equals zero. So it's exactly x square plus h plus y square. So as you can see, it is immediate to check that this quantity is bigger than one, and so I can apply the EED inequality with uh, C0 equal to two. And I did use from this immediately As a consequence, I can use the inequality which is here, and what I get is that x of t to the square plus y of t to the square is less than the same quantity at point zero, 
at time zero, sorry, times exponential minus 2t. Okay? And as you can see, in this specific example, uh, I get really something directly on the solution because now if I take the square root of this, this is really the natural distance, the L2 distance, or the two distance, if you wish, in finite dimension toward zero, and it tells you that it will be like exponential minus t, okay? So you directly get the large time behavior, the, let's say, quantitative large time behavior of the quantity here by using a tool which at some point does not refer explicitly to the equation. So in some sense, this is a method which enables you to sort of forget a little about the equation and try to get things out of estimates which are directly written on numbers if you are uh, in finite dimension, like for ODEs, or functions if you are in a infinite dimensional setting like you have in PDEs or integral equations. So let me now, uh, since I want really to devote most of, most of my time uh, to the Lando equation, let me uh, write down first an equation which looks somewhat like the Lando equation, but which is much simpler. In fact, it is linear, and uh, in which it's really possible to use all this machinery. So this equation is the standard Fokker-Planck equation, uh, which is something which has been written by physicists for many, many years. It was probably written first already in the 19th century. So this is next example. And this will be our first example in infinite dimension, that is, outside of the world of ODEs. Uh, let's now suppose that you have a function f, and I will write the variable uh, v, because it's typically a velocity, which is the variable here uh, in, the, in this function. This will be a density, so it will always be uh, non-negative. And um, we will consider that, uh, well, let's say the, the natural setting will be the space L1, but I will not write it immediately. Let me just say that here V is an element of Rn, so this can be written in any dimension, basically. Um, and the, the operator A that was uh, written down in the general abstract equation, in that case, it will be a differential operator which can be written in the following way. So this is a gradient with respect to the variable V here. Uh, so more precisely, this is a divergence of gradient F plus VF. So f as n variable, I write down the gradient. Uh, here I multiply uh, f by v, so I also get a vector here, so I have here an n-dimensional vector, and then I take the divergence of it, okay? Um, so this is the so-called Fokker-Planck operator. And as you can see, this is actually close to the Laplacian, this would be the Laplacian, and the main difference is that you have this uh, drift operator, which is added to the, to the Laplacian. Um, if you uh, had some training in probability, maybe you saw the same operator uh, called the uh, orstein uhlenbeck though uh, orstein uhlenbeck is rather used uh, for the semigroup related to the operator, let's say. Well, anyway, this is the same object. 
And so um, the first thing to observe is that uh, this operator uh, actually preserves positivity in the sense, more precisely, uh, its semigroup preserves positivity in the sense that if now you look at a solution of the equation df over dt equal af, then, and let's say f of uh, zero and v is given, then f of t and v is positive for all time if the same is true at time zero. This can easily be seen because you, uh, so the first term is a Laplacian, so the second order derivative, you know that if you look, let's say at the minimum, at this point, uh, you will have uh, a term which is uh, non-negative, and so you cannot go below uh, the, the minimum. And for the second part, it's also easy to see. You can just uh, see it by uh, developing the divergence of Vf uh, in two terms. So this is a property which can easily be seen at the uh, formal level. Moreover, where you have a second, um, you have a second uh, property, which is related to the fact that since this is a divergence, if you integrate, uh, you will get uh, zero. And so uh, you will propagate the L1 norm of F. So the integral of F of T and V, if F is a solution of the equation, will be equal to the same quantity at time zero, like this. So because of this, the natural uh, space in which uh, you want to work is the space E of functions f, depending on v, such that f is non-negative, and the integral of f is a given number. So let's say one. But you could put, of course, any other, any other number. So this is a natural space E in which you want to study the equation here, which is a Fokker-Planck equation. Uh, so the entropy, or let's say the Lyapunov functional, which is related to this equation, has been known for a long time. And this is actually uh, what in physics uh, we would rather call the uh, free energy. So let me write it. So this is a free energy. And this is defined as the integral of f log f, like this, plus f v square over 2. So if you are familiar with the entropy in kinetic theory, here you recognize the traditional entropy and you add to this entropy the kinetic energy. And when you do that, you, you get exactly what is usually called free energy uh, in physics. So let's check that H is indeed a Lyapunov functional and entropy for, for this equation here. So let F be a solution of 
of the Fokker-Planck equation. So this equation here. And let's <coughs> compute the derivative of h of f. So as you can see, sorry, the first part here, you take the derivative in time of f log f. This gives you log f plus 1 times df over dt. And the second part here, it just gives you the v square over 2. So you can write it like this. And you can replace df over dt by its value, which is af, which is this divergence here, OK? So you can rewrite it, log f plus 1 plus v square over 2 times the divergence of gradient f plus vf. Now you do an integration by part, OK? You assume that uh, there is no problem with uh, the boundaries because basically uh, you have taken a setting in which you are in L1. So doing the integration by parts gives you here the gradient of this quantity, which is nothing but gradient f over f coming out of this, plus v coming out of v square over 2. So this is times gradient f plus vf dv. And here you recognize that you have two terms which are proportional, uh, the coefficient of proportionality being f. And so it's naturally something which is non-positive. Let me write it maybe here because it can be, I hope it can still be seen at this level. So this can be written as the integral of f times gradient f over f plus v to the square dv. And this quantity is sometimes called the uh, relative Fisher information uh, for f. So we call it just minus d of f. And it's uh, clearly something which is uh, non-positive, OK? So in this situation, we now have an entropy structure. And we have to check first that this entropy structure is strict, and then that we have, hopefully, an entropy, entropy dissipation uh, estimate. So let's first check that the entropy structure is strict. So, uh, let's look at what happens when AF is equal to zero. As we could see, um, This is AF, OK, this quantity here. So if AF is equal to 0, then it's clear that D of F is equal to 0, because D of F is just the divergence of this term multiplied by something and then integrated, OK? So AF equal to 0 implies D of F is equal to 0. But now D of F is the integral of something which is non-negative, OK? So it will be equal to 0 if and only if this quantity here um, will be uh, uh, equal to 0. 
So as you can see, you will get up to points where f is equal to zero to gradient f over f plus v is equal to zero. So it's up to points where f is equal to zero. And now if you solve this, this equation, you get that f is uh, of the form constant time exponential minus v square over two, okay? Because you just have that the gradient of log of f is minus v. So when you take the primitive, you get that the log of f is like minus v square over two plus a constant, and then you take the exponential. And actually, the constant can be computed because we suppose that f has integral one. So actually, the, com the, the computation of the constant tells you that this is square root over two p to the n, which can be computed easily thanks to the Gauss integral. So uh, this thing is what I defined previously at the equilibrium that is f infinity. So as you can see, the equilibrium is exactly a Gaussian function of v, which is actually centered and reduced. Okay? So we are in a good uh, situation for showing the strict entropy structure because now it's clear that if you take and f infinity equal to this, then a f is equal to zero, and also d f is equal to zero. So this also implies those two things here, okay? And the last thing we have to check is that h is at its minimum only when f is equal to the Gaussian, okay? But this, so this is, uh, remember that this is under the constraint that the integral of f is equal to one. So if you now use uh, the Euler-Lagrange uh, uh, theory uh, at this level, uh, taking the derivative of this, you get exactly log f plus one plus v square over two. And this has to be equal to some constant time one, okay? So what you get is exactly that log f, plus one, log f plus v square over two is a constant, and this is exactly the same as saying that f is equal to f infinity, okay? So a very easy uh, computation, let's say, of uh, uh, variational calculus tells you that I don't know if it's really the English word for this. In French, it's calcul de variation, but anyway. So this gives you that uh, h of f is, sorry, h of f infinity is less than h of f for all f in E, except, of course, uh, f infinity. So we have the strict entropy structure in this uh, Fokker-Planck example. Um, now what about the entropy-entropy dissipation uh, estimate? As uh, you see, what we would like to get what we would like to get is that d of f, which is, if you remember, the integral on Rn of f times gradient f over f plus uh, v, like this. Is it bigger than some constant C0 times H of F minus H of F infinity, which is 
defined as the integral of f log f plus f v square over 2 uh, minus h of f infinity, which hopefully has been computed on my uh, slide, and which anyway should be minus n over 2 logarithm of 2 pi. So here we should add uh, n over 2 logarithm of 2 pi. This is the entropy, the free energy for f equal to this. So the question becomes, is it true that for any f in E, so any f positive, such that the integral is equal to 1, can we show that there exists a constant which satisfies this? So actually, it happens that the answer uh, has been known for now many years. And this is exactly the uh, Sobol, uh, logarithmic Sobolev inequality of Gross. which I think was first obtained in the mid-70s. So it's an inequality which is known. Actually, the proof is very interesting. And I would also like to add the name uh, of uh, Giuseppe Toscani, uh, who in 94 uh, first identified from the uh, uh, in the vocabulary of kinetic theory, the use of this uh, logarithmic Sobolev inequality for the, for the problem. And as a consequence, as a consequence, uh, we obtained that this quantity decreases exponentially fast, and actually the C0 is known, so let me if I'm not mistaken, it's two, yeah. So the answer is yes, and the number is two. Uh, and so thanks to this, it's possible to show that the, if you look at the solution of the Fokker-Planck equation, then this quantity here decays exponentially fast actually with a, an explicit rate which is known, which is two, uh, towards zero, okay? So, yeah. And I would like, so this is actually the example which is probably, in terms of linear equations, the closest to what will be presented then for the Landau equation. But actually, I would like to give a last example not sure that I will have time to, to finish it today, but we can finish it tomorrow anyway. It's called example four. And this is an example which comes from the theory of uh, reaction diffusion equations. I would like to present it, especially because I think that uh, Alexis Vasseur will present a talk on a model which is quite uh, close to what I will uh, now present. So this is reaction diffusion theory. And more precisely, this is reaction diffusion coming out of um, reversible chemistry. So the situation is the following. You imagine that you have two, uh, two chemical species, which are called A and B. And A and B can transform one into another reversibly. And uh, somehow you, the speed of the reaction 
depends on the catalyst, which is uh, spread in the uh, chemical reactor, uh, but not uniformly. So you denote by K of X the concentration of a catalyst. of this reaction. So what is the typical uh, equation you want to write down? So you call A and B the concentrations of A and B. And those are actually functions of time and space. X will live in a domain which is the chemical reactor. So this is, let's say, included in Rn. And let's say it is bounded and smooth. Well, T is just a, a non-negative number, which represents time. So what is the typical equation that one expects uh, for A and B. Well, first, first, uh, one takes into account the reaction. So here you have, a, let's say, a linear kinetic uh, reaction because you have uh, no extra species entering in the chemical reaction. So here you expect to have something which is proportional to B minus A, and here the same with A minus B, okay? Because, I mean, you will get A out of B, and A will disappear when it transforms in B, and the, of course a reverse for the, second, for the second equation. And in front, you will put something which is, let's say, proportional, but let's write it directly like K of X, so this is something which is proportional to the concentration of the catalyst. Okay. So this is, of course, a crude approximation, but let's say it's, it's not absurd. And uh, so this is for the reaction part. And then you take into account the fact that the concentration of the species A and B, they will uh, diffuse in the reactor. And actually, they will diffuse, but not not necessarily with the same diffusion rate. Because A and B, for example, can be molecules which have a different size or a different uh, mass. And because of this, the diffusion in the reactor is typically um, something which uh, is complicated and there is no reason why D1 and D2 should be equal. And it's important here to take it different in order to get something which is mathematically interesting. Of course, if you take the same, basically you can subtract and add the equation and then it's, it's extremely easy. But if you take it different, the mathematical theory is a little more uh, intricate. Okay, so I think I will uh, finish with this. Let me just add, it's a false, false exit. <laughs> Let me just add the boundary condition. <laughs> which is here typically a uh, Neumann boundary condition, which corresponds to the fact that you expect the species to remain inside the reactor. They do not exceed the reactor. And so you add those two things. I think I will stop here and we will check that this satisfies the, all the assumptions previously written down tomorrow. Thanks a lot.